Good morning, everyone. It's beginning to look a lot like Christmas. Everywhere. No, we're not going to sing that one, but I know some of you, how many of you love it? How many of you don't love it? Yeah, Jim's way in the back there. I'm with you, Jim, but it is beautiful. So let's stand together as we begin our worship service, and we will sing His Forever. friend of sinners, loved me ere I knew him, drew me with his cords of love, tightly bound me to him, round my heart still closely twined, the ties that none can sever. Is and he is mine forever and forever. Jesus, friend of sinners, a crown of thorns you wore for me, bruised for my transgression. Pierce for my iniquities, the wrath of God that I deserve was poured out on the innocent. He took my place, my soul to save. Now I am His forever. of sinners I love to tell the story Redeeming love has been my plea and will be when in glory No death, no life, nor anything can never separate me A love that will Forever, 
the power of hell forever defeated now it is well i'm walking in freedom for god so to love god so to love the world praise god praise god from whom all blessings flow praise him Praise Him for the wonders of His love. Praise God, praise God, from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, praise Him for the wonders of His love. For God so loved the world that he gave us his one and only son to save us whoever believes in him will live forever the power of hell forever defeated now it is well i'm walking in freedom for god so to love god so to love the world Bring all your failures, bring your addictions, come lay them down at the foot of the cross. Jesus is waiting, God so loved the world. I don't know if it is the snow or more light coming in through the windows, what it is, but uh, your singing today is great. And uh, it can't help but be great when we've got lyrics like, God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son for us. What a blessing it is. Now, some of you, uh, probably the really alert ones said, hmm, there is a new voice, a new face that's in the team today, and you are right. You didn't even need coffee to pull that out. <laughs> Rhonda Dick and her husband uh, served the Lord in the uh, south side of Milwaukee, longtime friends of Jen Verholst. And so Jen said, is there, there a place where she might be able to do that? And sure, that, that, that would be just fine. And uh, that's been, been, been good to have her here today. Somebody was here early and said, um, there's someone new there. Who is that? And I said, well, that's Rhonda. And they said, well, is there more? And I said, yeah, I met her at Walgreens. <laughs> we, we haven't resorted to that, but I, I just heard her humming a, a few aisles over and went over and talked to her. Um, at any rate, we are uh, delighted to lift our voices and uh, sing these songs that declare God's truth. We want to take a moment here to alert you. It's in print, but well, I know what haps, happens to printed things in the, in the sheet that we hand out here. It gets stuck in a Bible, and we don't always pay attention to it. So we've got the Siplas, Scott and Tracy, that are coming here to tell us about an event that's a few months away, but, it, but we know it takes some advanced planning. So uh, they're coming up here, and let's see. We'll use number one here. And uh, we've got a, a, a retreat coming up, and we'd like to hear more about it. All right, if we could play the, the video first, we'd appreciate that, and then we'll, we'll talk about the logistics here.
All right, so we just want to thank uh, DJ for making that video for us. We had no idea that he was doing that at the last retreat and uh, presented that to us, and we were blown away, and it was really, really neat. I don't know if you caught, like, the little clever things that he did within the video, but, like, the snacks, and then the snacks are eaten, <laughs> fireplace going, and then at the end the fire is kind of dwindling. So it was, it was really neat to see that, and we appreciate that, so thank you. Um, we're just excited about uh, the marriage retreat coming up. It's only a few months away, and we do have some uh, information to get out to you about what's going to take place there. You saw a lot of activities being done in the video. We want to stress that you don't have to do all the activities. Um, there is time to just sit around the fireplace, hang out with uh, your spouse um, if you'd like to do that, or you could just play some games with people as well. Well, I know when I looked outside this morning and in the video, there's lots of snow. It made me really excited for the marriage retreat coming up. It is a really beautiful time. And like Scott said, uh, you can do as much, as little as you want. DJ and Tiani did everything. So it looks like, oh, everyone's, but a lot of people just played board games, sat by the fire, spent time with their spouse. A lot of fellowship went on. Um, the date said February 18th to 19th, which I know it seems far away, but it really isn't. We would like people to sign up as early as possible because the last two years we have been full and then some. We have kind of made things work and some of us have stayed with the Dickinsons or the Taylors. Um, it will be $150 per couple this year if you're staying on site and if you are staying off site like in a hotel or driving, it's $120. And is that everything I think? And just one other thing, maybe some of you are out there and you're thinking, well, we've been married 40, 50 years, we got this figured out. Please come then and encourage the rest of us who have not been married as long. We want to learn from you, okay? So we're just, the invitation for this marriage retreat isn't to necessarily like, be like, oh, we're just starting out, we need to get this figured out. It's, it's to encourage each other, so we really want to stress that. And we're the body of Christ and that's what we should be doing together is encouraging one another. Um, if you have any questions about it, just contact uh, the Hillmeyers. You can contact us or the Caspers. Thanks. Well, we will take time to pray here and uh, continue out with worship. <clears throat> I will say, <clears throat> we have had a wonderful time at, at the retreat. <clears throat> here it goes again, folks. Anyway, the... Uh, the word on the street from these planning people are is that they won't make me quote poetry to Sue. And uh, I tried that a couple years ago, and the rumors still circulate about what, uh, what an event that was. I am so glad DJ wasn't there with his camera. I just misread some things is all. That's it. Anyway, we do hope you can participate regardless uh, if you're... Uh, brand new to the husband and wife thing or been married years and years. It's a, it's a good thing. Let's pray together. Father, we are humbled to be singing these songs of truth about you, and we look forward to doing more. We thank you for the way that you have blessed us. Beyond us as a church family in the body of Christ, there is the, the blessings of our country. This past week, we've thought again about the veterans that have served and their families many times making sacrifices that are unknown to nearly all citizens of the U.S. And yet those acts of service and devotion are, are appreciated and you've used uh, people to strengthen our country. Our country's in, in such turmoil these days. And uh, you'd listen to how dissimilar we think and respond and yet uh, in the history of our, our country we have seen your hand too and so uh, we praise you for the blessings that are spiritual but we also thank you for for those that come from living where we do in this country we pray that as we continue to lift our voices you would be pleased with uh, what comes from our lips because it represents our hearts to that end, we pray in Jesus name amen
is not in what I own, not in the strength of flesh and bone, but in the costly wounds of love at the cross. My worth is not in skill or name, in win or lose, in pride or shame. But in the blood of Christ that flowed at the cross, I rejoice in my Redeemer, greatest treasure, wellspring of my soul. I will trust in Him, no other. My soul is satisfied in Him alone. As summer flowers we fade and die, then youth and beauty hurry by. But life eternal calls to us at the cross. I will not boast in wealth or might, or human wisdom's fleeting light. But I will boast in knowing Christ at the cross. I rejoice in my Redeemer, greatest treasure, wellspring of my soul. I will trust in Him, no other. My soul is satisfied in Him alone. You wonders here that I confess My worth and my unworthiness My value fixed, my ransom paid At the cross I rejoice in my Redeemer Greatest treasure, wellspring of my soul I will trust in Him, no other. My soul is satisfied in Him alone. I rejoice in my Redeemer, greatest treasure, wellspring of my soul. I will trust in Him, no other. My soul is satisfied in Him alone. So this satisfied in him alone. Please stand with us. in his hands who has numbered every grain of sand kings and nations tremble at his voice all creation rises to rejoice behold our God Seated on his throne, come let us adore him. Behold our King, nothing can compare. Come let us adore him. given counsel to the Lord who can question any of his words who can teach the one who knows all things who can fathom all his wondrous deeds 
This letter is anonymous, and people have wondered for a long time whether Paul wrote it or maybe one of his co-workers like Barnabas or Apollos, but really we just don't know. In chapter 2, we discover that the author had a first-hand relationship with the disciples who were themselves around Jesus, so we know that this letter is anchored in the teaching of the apostles. We also don't know who the audience of this letter was or even where they lived. The author knows them really well, and he assumes that they have a thorough knowledge of the Old Testament scriptures, especially the storyline of the first five books of the Bible, the Torah, about how Abraham's family became the nation of Israel, about how Moses led them out of slavery in Egypt to Mount Sinai, where they received the Torah, and they made a covenant with God, where they built the tabernacle, where the priests offered sacrifices, and also about how they wandered through the wilderness on their way to the promised land. The author just expects that the readers know all of the details about these stories. And so most likely the audience is made up of Jewish Christians. That's where the name of the letter comes from. We also have clues from chapter 10 that this church community was facing persecution and even imprisonment because of their association with Jesus. Some in the community were walking away from Jesus and abandoning the faith altogether. And this explains the purpose and the structure of this letter. First, there's a short introduction, which is followed by four sections where the author compares and contrasts Jesus with key people and events from Israel's history. Jesus is first compared with angels in the Torah, second with Moses and the Promised Land, third with priests and Melchizedek, and lastly with the sacrifices and the covenant. And the author has two main goals in all of these contrasts. The first goal is to elevate Jesus as superior to anyone or anything else, showing that Jesus is worthy of all their trust and devotion. But his second goal is this, it's to challenge the readers to remain faithful to Jesus despite persecution. So in every section, he includes a strong warning not to abandon Jesus. 
So let's dive in now and see how this all unfolds. The elevation of Jesus begins in the opening sentence of the introduction. In the past, God spoke to our ancestors in many different ways. But in these last days, he has spoken to us in his son. So the author saying that Jesus is superior to all of the previous ways that God has revealed himself to Israel. He then makes this astounding claim that Jesus is the radiance of God's glory and the exact imprint of God's nature. These metaphors are making the closest possible identification between Jesus and God. So Jesus is what the rays of light are to the sun, or Jesus is what the wax impression is to the signet ring. For this author, there is no God apart from Jesus. Jesus is God become human as the Son. And it's this elevated view of Jesus that's then explored throughout the rest of the letter. In the first section, the author compares Jesus with angels, which might strike you as kind of odd, like why angels? In Jewish tradition, it was taught, based on Deuteronomy chapter 33, verse 2, that the Torah and the words of God were delivered to Moses at Mount Sinai by angels. And so by saying that Jesus is superior to angels, the author is claiming that Jesus and his message of good news are superior to all previous messengers of God's word. And so the first warning flows from this very point. If Israel was called to pay attention to the Torah that was delivered by angels, how much more should we pay attention to the message that was announced by the Son of God? And not only that, given Jesus' status high above the angels, how remarkable is it? that he gave up that high status to become human, to suffer, and to die. In Jesus, we see God's greatest glory and God's great humility as Jesus sympathetically joined himself to humanity's tragic fate. In chapters 3 and 4, the author moves on to argue that Jesus is superior to Moses, who led the people of Israel through the wilderness and built the tabernacle. Jesus is also the leader of God's people, but in him we see not the builder of just a tent, but of all creation. Then the author retells the story of how the Israelites rebelled against Moses in the wilderness, and they lost their chance to enter into the rest that God offered them in the promised land. And so here comes the second warning. If Jesus is greater than Moses, how much higher are the stakes if we rebel against him? We also are in a wilderness-like environment where we have to trust God for the future rest in God's new creation. So let's make sure that we don't rebel like Israel did in the wilderness and lose out on God's gracious offer to enter his new creation. In chapters 5 through 7, the author then compares Jesus with Israel's priests that come from the line of Aaron. Their role was to represent Israel before God and to offer sacrifices that atoned for or covered over the sins of the people. But, he points out, the priests were themselves morally flawed people, and so they constantly had to offer sacrifices for their own sins as well as for everybody else's. Something more was needed. And so he then argues that Jesus was that something more. He's the ultimate priest. But Jesus did not come from the line of Aaron. Rather, Jesus was a priest in the order of Melchizedek that mysterious priest king from ancient Jerusalem, and he appears in the stories about Abraham. We also find in Psalm 110 that the messianic king from the line of David will be a priest in the order of Melchizedek. So the author's whole point is this. Jesus is the ultimate priest king. He's morally flawless. He's eternally available for his people, and so he's superior to any other mediator between God and humans. And thus comes his warning in this section. To reject Jesus is to reject one's best and only chance to be fully reconciled to God, so don't do that. Which transitions us into the last comparison in chapters 8 through 10. The author shows how Jesus' death on the cross was the ultimate sacrifice, superior to all the animal sacrifices offered in the temple. Those sacrifices had to be offered constantly, both daily but also yearly on the Day of Atonement. Jesus offered his life once and for all. And it was sufficient to cover the sins of the whole world. And so the author warns the audience from walking away from Jesus. It's like turning your back on a gracious offer of God's forgiveness. Why would you do that? Jesus' sacrifice is permanent, he says. And it's the foundation for the new covenant spoken of in the prophets, where all sins are forgiven. So now that the author has elevated Jesus through all of these contrasts, this final section is one big challenge to follow Jesus. So think big picture. In Jesus, they have found God's very word. 
In Jesus, they have hope for the new creation. Jesus is their eternal priest. He's the perfect sacrifice. And so now, they should follow all the great models of faith found throughout the story of the scriptures, and they should remain faithful to Jesus, trusting that despite whatever hardship and persecution, God will not abandon his people. That's the basic flow of thought throughout the letter, which the author calls right here at the very end, a brief word of exhortation. Here's a couple of extra tips for reading this letter. Whenever the author quotes from the Old Testament scriptures, which is like every other sentence, stop and go look up the reference and read that quotation in its original context. And sometimes you'll be puzzled, but more often you'll see all kinds of extra cool connections that you would never notice otherwise. It's totally worth the effort. You should also just know that these warning passages they're going to make you uncomfortable, and that's kind of the point. They're not there to make you afraid. They're there to show you that rejecting Jesus is foolish because he's so awesome. These warnings all serve the larger purpose of the letter, to show that Jesus is the ultimate revelation of God's love and mercy. And that's what the letter of the Hebrews is all about. I thought it was worth taking eight minutes <coughs> uh, to give you an overview on that. Now, I, I need to explain that last week we got through that first message just fine. And uh, I tried, and of course we had the Lord's table as well. And then second service, we made it part of the way through, and this voice started going nuts. I mean, it was bad. And I couldn't finish words. I mean, it, it was just terrible. We wound up stopping, just ending the service because I couldn't speak. And I almost felt like I wish I had a sign that said, His name shall be John. Because <laughs> that happened to another guy uh, that was serving the Lord. And uh, <clears throat> anyway, so now we're in this spot where we're, we're on different sections or different things. So what we're going to do today is uh, give you extra material that fits into Hebrews, but then we're going to try to get our, our both services back on the same schedule as we move forward from here. I think the only one that's going to be really surprised is someone who came to the 8 o'clock service last week and is attending the 1045, and they're going to hear the same thing again and, and miss this. But uh, in case you did not get to the table back there, we have a few copies of this. Um, it, it was the last shot of that. And I hesitated even using that video for the simple reason that way back there, the print gets really small, and yet the, the guy speaking every word that was on that uh, description, I thought, had merit there too. And it's good not to lose sight of, of the whole book. And so uh, if you're interested in that, we've got them on the table. And if, if they're all gone and you still want one, we can make more of those. Um, uh, that came from the Bible Project, and uh, we didn't have to create that. Obviously, some of you are very familiar with that. I would like to direct your attention to Psalm 2. <clears throat> you know Psalm 1. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the, the scornful. You know that section. Psalm 2 uh, couples with Psalm 1 to give kind of a, 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 a basis for what is unfolding in the book of Psalms uh, as a whole, thinking about the grand themes of obedience and also what happens to the rebellious ones. And uh, there's blessings and judgments that come through there. But we're going to look at, at Psalm 2. The reason why is going to become apparent as we read through the text because these phrases that are in Psalm 2 show up again. But we want to look first at what was it like in, in the culture to which it was first spoken. When you look, <clears throat> excuse me, in Psalm 2, verse 1, it says, Why do the nations rage and the people plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, let us burst their bonds apart and cast away their cords from us. So I want to stop there. It sounds like a, a very somber start to this thing. It's a contrast. In chapter 1, you've got this individual man that he's blessed because he's walking in obedience. Here we're finding 
uh, national implications, a group of people that are plotting to work against, to rebel against God. So that contrast is taken through here. And, uh, uh, but what I would point out right off the bat is that in this psalm, there is no heading of introduction. Some of them say that this psalm was written by David or the sons of Korah. Or this was written by, by Moses. You know, and when you look here, you can ask the question, so who wrote this? Because there's, there's no heading. Uh, but it is referenced by, by the number, the second psalm. That's mentioned in Acts. And then it goes on in Acts chapter 4 to say that David wrote this uh, being under the, the influence, the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. So uh, David wrote it, and he did so with the, uh, with the power of the Holy Spirit. You know, if you look for another heading, look at chapter 3 of Psalm, and you'll see a Psalm of David when he fled from Absalom, his sons. It was so, we know that David wrote it. Uh, let's just take a quick scan through these few verses, and the first thing I'd point out is that these nations, Gentile nations now, or non-Jewish ones, are plotting and scheming and planning. Uh, they're plotting against the God of the universe, Yahweh. And it says, Quite clearly, they're doing this in vain. Uh, it's pointless. You can plan all you want, people. It's, it's not going to be fruitful. There's no positive results that come from it. And then what are they railing against? Against the Lord, Yahweh. That's what that capital L-O-R-D is referencing. And against his anointed. Anointed is capitalized there. And yet this whole psalm was called a royal psalm. When David wrote this, obviously it was not just for, for him. I don't know when he wrote it. But it was often used for the coronation of their kings. It was read then, referenced then. Because they realized that as a uh, earthly king over a kingdom, you were still operating under the umbrella that God put there. And so it, it, the rebellion is against that. And then uh, the next thing, in the next group of verses we find here, it says that, that the Lord, Yahweh, is mocking. He's ridiculing them. Uh, do you see that? He who sits in the heavens laughs. I don't know if you've ever thought about does God laugh? I wonder what kind of humor Jesus had. You know, not the biting, sar sarcastic humor that demeans somebody else, but I wondered what it would be like to be around humor that is sin-free. And uh, I, I don't know the answer to that completely. I can Im try to imagine it. I try things, and sometimes what I think is funny is hurtful. And you've really got to watch those things. But here it says God laughs. Why is he laughing, though? The Lord holds them in derision. It tells you point blank. He is laughing because it says this is pointless, people. You nations that think you're in control. Uh, no, it's not going to happen that way. Uh, by the way, who is in control of the change of our climate? Is it not God? He is. Now that doesn't mean we just pollute our ways around it, all that, but, but let us not mix the two ideas here that God is the one that's in control. Man does not have the ability uh, to control these things. That belongs to God. This psalm teaches that. And he responds in anger. There's a consistency here. Then he will speak to them in his wrath and terrifying uh, them in his fury, saying, As for me, I've set my king on Zion, my holy hill. We well, have got this consistency that when, when people are in rebellion, God responds that way. There are all kinds of illustrations. I, c I can only reference them. I've got them down here, but we will not take time today to unpack them. But that was what he promised to the nation of Israel. If you're walking in obedience, that's a place of blessing. If you rebel against that, I will correct. If nations are doing things that are contrary to me, I, I can take them out. And he did. 
And he did so in no uncertain terms. Now, you can look at Deuteronomy 11, Deuteronomy 29, that kind of thing is promised in, in verses 24 through 28. Psalm 60, verses 1 through 3, show that God responds to those that are rebelling consistently, that there is a, a problem with him when he runs into people who are opposing what he wants. Verse 6, as for me, I set my king on Zion, my holy hill. He announces the installation of his anointed king. So the next section of verses then, we see the king established. Well, we're kind of flowing through this rather rapidly. I will tell of the decree. The Lord said to me, you are my son. Today I have begotten you. Bing, 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 bing. You remember hearing that before? As we're in Hebrews? That, that this is where it is originally in this royal psalm. What was David thinking about when he penned those words? The Davidic covenant. You could go back and look in, in 2 Samuel chapter 7, verses 12 through 14, and you will find this kind of uh, viewpoint given. That David was assured that one of his descendants would be on the throne, and that throne would never end. That rule would never end. So there's a historical context. David is writing these a long time ago, way before Jesus came. Uh, way before the, the prophet Isaiah ever wrote. And some of you remember that even his words about this coming Messiah and, and the details around it predated Jesus by 750 years. But David goes back a millennium before that at least hundreds of years, hundreds of years. The, the psalm, uh, by, by the way, we can look at what will be under this king's authority. Ask of me and I will make the nations your heritage and the ends of your earth your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron and dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel, clay pot, it'll shatter. Nations of the kingdom it don't, that are against you, don't worry about it. The ends of your earth, the earth will be your possession. This is a, a wonderful picture of what this anointed king will have. Well, the rulers then are, are given one final reminder of this. Listen, if you're plotting to go against the Lord, the creator, sustainer of the universe, don't do it. And so then, look what it says in verse 6. Now, therefore, O kings, be wise, be warned, O rulers of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. You, you really have to pay attention, kings of the earth. You bring yourself under the authority of the one true God, regardless of what Monarchy says your limits of your kingdom are you're still under the true and living God. Be warned. And then this unusual phrase, kiss the sun. Kiss the sun lest he be angry and you perish in the way. For his wrath is quickly kindled. Kiss the sun. You know what makes that phrase jump out to the original readers is that 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 it was spoken, recorded in Aramaic. The rest of this is in Hebrew, but that little reminder at the end was Aramaic, so they paid attention to it. Uh, what, what's, what's meant by the, the kissing of the sun? Well, it's an act of homage. It, it's respect. It's, it's submission to understanding there's no one worth more attention and devotion than the one who is receiving the kiss. And then the blessing says, blessed are all who take refuge in him. There is no refuge from God if he is after you, but there is refuge in him. That's a wonderful little blessing in the very words that are, are recorded there. That's, that's the historical context of Psalm 2. 
You read that, and you can study it alongside Psalm 1, and the rest of the things, and, and you will gain benefit from it. Um, I don't know if any of you have ever seen the I Spy books, but when my grandkids had them, and I think, I'm not sure we had one in our house when my kids were growing up. We may have. Uh, that was a while back. But I... I can sit there with grandkids, and it, it, they're the coolest books. Because you're looking, trying to take in the image on this book. And then you're trying to, you can see the big theme. Uh, this one has cars in it, but sometimes they have letters and numbers and shapes, and sometimes it's a, a storage room, and sometimes it's a classroom, and sometimes it might be a kitchen. And they have all of these elements related to that and then along the bottom it will tell you i spy and they give you 10 12 things that you look back through and you study the picture for it and i already know people in the back can't see it but i spy a zebra jeep a bird house and three beeps well you know that it's hard for me to see it even here but um but at any rate if you study that you're going to find a Jeep that has stripes on it, and you're going to find uh, the blocks with beep on it, and you're going to see three of those and other things hidden in there, five thimbles and a clock and an apple and a duck. And, and yeah, I got to look at that picture for a while. Why am I showing you that? Because when you, you pull back and you start looking to say what else is in the picture, it's a perfect illustration of what I'd like us to do now. Psalm 2, verse 7 says, The Lord said to me, You are my son. Today I have begotten you. So if that is in the psalm, not just historical context is important, but what about the biblical context? What is it that we find? Let's look a little closer at Scripture and say, What is What's significant about this? Why do we pay attention to it in a study of Hebrews? Why did it go back to this royal psalm? What else is there? What is the common thread between this? Could it require a little more focused attention to see? Probably will. Uh, let's look here. Acts chapter 4. <clears throat> And we've got these in your notes. Oh, by the way, I failed to mention that. Did you catch that, that the half sheet really was for today? I should have mentioned that before, but if you're trying to use the back of the bulletin alone, you're going to be set up for the second service, not this one. And uh, so we, we, we want to look at, at, at these verses here. What's it say in Acts? This is where the Jerusalem believers were praying for boldness. Now, I'm going to read. You can listen or, or follow along here, but I'm starting in verse 24. I don't have all of it on the screen. And when they heard it, they lifted their voices together to God and said, Sovereign Lord, who made heaven and earth and the sea and everything in them, who through the mouth of our father David, your servant, said by the Holy Spirit, why did the Gentiles rage and the people plot in vain? Does that sound familiar? Uh, that. The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his anointed. Oh, that's right from Psalm 2. This is showing up in the believer's request for prayer in the book of Acts, for boldness. They're the, the requesting boldness. For truly, in this city, they were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus, whom you appointed, uh, anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the people of Israel. You can see that this passage is now being connected to Jesus. Whatever was in the history, we now have the next step. Okay, what is it in the early believers as they pray? Does it, it stop there? No. Here's what it says in Acts 13. This is when Paul was speaking at Antioch in Pisidia. And not, not Antioch in, in the land that he was sent from, but a different one. And he says, we bring good news that what God promised to the fathers, 
This he has fulfilled to us, their children, by raising Jesus. As also is written in the second psalm, You are my son, today I have begotten you. Huh. They're quoting Psalm 2, the very phrase that is in verse 7, and then he's saying it's being fulfilled, it's been fulfilled in Jesus, raising Jesus. Now what is the point that the writer is making in Hebrews 1? He uses the same quote. What, what is it in the context of chapter 1 that he's saying? Well, do you understand that Jesus is superior to the angels? He is He's different, completely different. What is the writer's point in, in verse 5? That he's appointed the high priest. So, also Christ did not exalt himself to be made a high priest, but was appointed by him to whom he said, uh, to, who said to him, you are my son, today I've begotten you. We've got it in Acts, a couple of spots. We find it here. Oh, it shows up again. In Revelation. This time, it's, it's in the context of a message to the church at Thyatira. That the letters to these churches, real places, but what is spoken of here is of interest to us. Verse 26 says, The one who conquers and the one who keeps my works until the end, to him I will give authority over the nations, and he will rule them with a rod of iron, as when earthen pots are are broken to pieces, even as I myself have received authority from my Father. Who is speaking here? It's none other than Jesus. What is he referencing? Psalm 2. The very thing that was promised in Psalm 2 in this general way that, that they read in the coronation of their kings, thinking this is a very picturesque language that the enemies will be subdued no jesus is saying here in revelation i have been given this promise i am the one that will sustain uh, this rule forever and ever i will give him the morning star he who has an ear let him hear what the spirit says to the churches the common thread it, you couldn't have missed it. From Acts to Revelation, every mention ties this declaration to Jesus. Not just any old king. And that's what they read in the Old Testament. And when the kings came into their reign, that was referenced. It was, but it was pointing ahead. In these closing minutes, I want to ask the question then. Uh, does it strike you why did God declare, you are my son, today I have begotten you? Why, why the word today? Where was the son in Genesis? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Or John 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The Son has always been with the Father. How come you find a statement like this that says, Today you are my Son, my begotten one. I've begotten you today. What is the significance? Why would he say that? The Son is eternal. How can it be today? I have become a father. That's the literal meaning of begotten. How is it that he could say today, I've begotten you? This isn't the only time that God spoke. Do you remember the gospel accounts? Three of them told us about the baptism of Jesus. And what was it that the people around heard when Jesus was baptized? This is my beloved son. You better listen to him. And whom I'm well pleased. The Father calls that out. And, and it's recorded in Matthew and Mark and Luke. And then 
You have the Mount of Transfiguration and Matthew and Peter and James and John are there and they're blown away by what they experienced there. And in that moment, do you remember what they heard? This is my beloved Son with whom I'm well pleased. He has spoken already to people about His Son and the fact that they, He was pleased with His Son and we should listen to Him. So then, if God said that previously, why is it such a big deal in Hebrews? When would this fit? When did God actually say this to the Son? Does it matter? Especially since God's not bound by, by time, and He is not. Every day is today with God. Maybe that's what we're supposed to mean, except that we find an important answer given in scripture it's not referring uh, to the time of begetting of becoming a father too in 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 that sense but it's more referencing the status and and the fact of sonship now let's let's just recall a couple of things here it's a fascinating chain in hebrews 1 Verse 3, uh, we just sang, Behold our God. Oh, I'm telling you, I'm glad I wasn't trying to sing today because the emotions of those words just came, came at me out of Hebrews. What is it? Seated on the throne, that's Hebrews 1, 3. And, and what does it say in that spot? It, it says that he sat down at the right hand of the Father, the majesty on high. Oh, what did it say in 2, chapter 2, verse 9 of Hebrews? Jesus, the anointed, Jesus Christ. That's what, that's what that word means. In Hebrews 2, verse 7, that word anointed. I wrote it to, I forgot what verse it is. But the anointed word is the Hebrew word Messiah. Uh, the Greek word is Christ. That means the anointed one. But in Hebrews 2.9 it says that he is crowned with glory and honor. It's past tense. It's happened. When did it happen? It, it, it happened when he came back to glory. And then the light bulb goes on because... Now, when we look at Romans 1, it makes perfect sense. Verses 2 through 4, we've got Paul explaining this thing. And he said, concerning his son, who was descended from David according to the flesh, and declared to be the son of God in power according to the spirit of holiness, by his resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ, our Lord. He was declared the Son of God by His resurrection from the dead. Isn't that fascinating? The very thing that we find and trip over and we see all that phrase keeps showing up. Which, when did it happen? It happened at, at the resurrection. When He went back, He told Mary, I've not yet ascended to my Father. And, and He is there, seated at the right hand. And, and Today, now it's proven, the eternal Son was with the Father all through the past. But there was something unique that occurred in the God-man, Jesus Christ. His humanity, it, it comes together with his deity again. And then at that moment when he is the perfect sacrifice, it's going to come back again when we think about the high priest work. It's that combination of... It had to be human. Otherwise, he could not die. But he had to be perfect. Therefore, he had to be God. There's only one possible way. And then when we find the, the declaration prophesied in chapter 2 of Psalms so many hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years earlier, and then we find the statement applied in Hebrews, ah, I spotted it. There's so many things we could talk about. The miracles he did, the virgin birth and the, the, the 
speaking of things into existence and and how does all this happen and then we can come to the point of our redemption and it's no now see he was with me for all eternity past but jesus the god man is my son today i become a father to him it's proof everything that i promised is now verified in the person of the resurrected lord sitting on the throne what a God. Man. My mind goes to Philippians 2. That at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow. Every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord. You see it in glory. Someday it will be there. If you have not trusted Jesus, I'm telling you, it is amazing to see God's love given for us. And then to know it couldn't have happened any other way that then for God to take the form of man and he faced every temptation that we do. You know what that is? We want things our way. Why, why do so many people get locked into pornography? Because they want what they want when they want it. And the make-believe world is somehow thinking they're going to be satisfied with it. And it doesn't. Why does the angry person struggle with anger? Because he wants things his way. And when it doesn't become his way. He blows up. Why, why do people get messed up in finances thinking that whatever they have is going to bring satisfaction because they're, they're on the wrong thing? And it's not about bread. Man does not live by bread alone. The Lord went through all of that. He understands and he came to save our time is gone, but, but this, this has been an exciting thing for me. It has energized my worship. It has made me patient with people who are caught in sinful patterns. It's made me humbled to think that why would God ever use me? I, I don't have an explanation, and it was a good reminder you don't know how ugly it was last Sunday when I'm trying to speak and I can't and the people are feeling badly for me and I'm thinking, Lord, I don't understand. But then I realize it's not about me but it is about him. Um, the cool thing is while I got the coolest job description in the world that I get to talk about how awesome Jesus is can I just remind you who know Jesus? You've got the same job description. So communicate that in Thanksgiving. Communicate that at Christmas. Communicate it on Groundhog's Day. I don't care. It's just we're going to take this message to a, a community that is in desperate, desperate need of it. Let's ask for his help. Let's ask for his help. Lord, so thankful for the clarity of your word to uncover the little connections is, is just a fascinating thing. Lord, the people who studied the Old Testament scriptures that to whom the writer of Hebrews was communicating, they, they needed to see that Jesus was there all the time in the Old Testament. I pray that we would latch on to that. Looking at it from our vantage point, we've been given the privilege of seeing things in a, a better way because of the completed word. I pray that it would motivate us to speak love and a message of hope to a world that is crazy lost. And we may never get alongside of our 
elected leaders, but we will be alongside of our neighbors, our co-workers, our family members, even people that come here visiting. I pray that you would overwhelm us with what you have put together for our salvation. In your son's most special name we pray, amen. Thank you.